Hey folks, welcome back to the Dark Horse Podcast live stream number 116 retro 20th century Cold War edition Q&A segment. All right. All right. Our question, we'll just get we'll just right, into right in. We'll just get no, right into launch. it. We'll just get right into it. not launched. That's a... No, yeah. terrible. We, we want to we no. not say things like that the way we used to not and talk about anymore. Yeah. explosives in airports and things like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, from the Discord this week. All right. So those of you who are on either of our Patreons get access to the Discord, and every week they ask us a question, and here it is. I have been learning about the phenomenon of the WEF's young global leaders who have infiltrated cabinets, in the words of Klaus Schwab. Tulsi Gabbard and Dan Crenshaw are among them. Did you know this, Brett? Yes, I learned that this week. This week. Um, I will say I am on high alert about the World Economic Forum and its infiltration of cabinets. That said, um, I know and quite like Tulsi Gabbard and Dan Crenshaw. And I think we need to be very careful not to engage in too much heuristic thinking, which is to say, mm -hmm. to the extent that either Tulsi or Dan or anybody else has been persuaded by the World Economic Forum to betray their species and destroy planet Earth in a fit of great reset or whatever it is that those crazy people are up to, then that's a problem. But to the extent that somebody may have been designated a young global leader and then presumably encountered the Great Reset plan for unmaking of the West um, and said, hey, Klaus, go fuck yourself. Um, my feeling is all right. That's all well and good. So anyway, I have, I have seen no reason to think that either one of these two people was compromised by their encounter with the WEF. And um, anyway, uh, I certainly hope that I'm correct in my estimation of them. Awesome. First question from the darkhorsesubmissions.com site this week. Do you know anything about the incident at the high security lab in Manitoba here in Canada? Two scientists were escorted and removed. They had sent viruses to Wuhan in early 2019 without authorization. Everyone was immediately shocked that one virus was Ebola. I'm more interested in the other virus, Henipa. Is it possible that it was this virus that became COVID? Question mark. I can't make sense of Trudeau's behavior. The unnecessary election, the insistence on 100% vax rate, the most recent debacle. Um, no, I'm not aware of this <clears throat> incident at all. Yeah, I don't. I don't know, and I and so I don't know. Um, I don't know when. I don't. So that's loud. Yes. Um, um, I don't. So. You know, it says they had sent viruses to Wuhan in early 2019, but I don't know if this incident is the beginning of COVID or now or or what. Yes. Well, let's just so, say. Anyway, the short version is we don't know about this. We don't know about it. Um, we are stuck in the following predicament, as presumably are most of our viewers and listeners, that there does seem to be an awful lot of nonsense about which uh, our antagonists, like Trudeau, presumably have better information than we do. Mm. I don't think we yet know what this is about. And that's a problem because to the mm. extent that what we are trying to do is make sense of the evidence as we are able to, to engage it, we effectively have to lag behind what may be going on. In other words, we don't want to get ahead of the evidence. In fact, we should be somewhat behind the evidence in terms of um, concluding things. But I think we would be foolish not to imagine that the rent-seeking elites who have all sorts of unearned power over us have not found an angle in all of this that benefits them at yeah. our expense. Right. Um, so anyway... I. Uh, quite independent of whether or not they were in any way instrumental in making it all happen. But they, you know, they, they definitely have an angle by which they profit. Well, let's put it this way. Um, in the extreme, somebody could have caused sure. the COVID pandemic with purposes. Short of that, there's all kinds of ways in which they could have gotten the jump on the rest of us um, right. by having better information than we did. And my guess is the reality is somewhere in there, but I'm 
I think all possibilities are remain on the table except for we were all caught equally off guard by this, which I think that uh, is not what happened. Yeah, we were not all equally caught off guard. Um, right, and as for Trudeau's behavior, um, it it depends on what kind of a what kind of a figure he is. And I mean, he may not know what kind of figure he is, but you know, he may be a fall guy. Yeah, I don't think uh, his his. Um, I don't think it rises to the level of behavior. I think <laughs> that puts too kind a spin on what that young man has been up to. And oh, man. He's, <laughs> he's, he's like within a year or two of us. Hence, I think. my calling him a young man. It Maybe I'm a, wrong about a, that. A hopeful, I see, kind of a. Um, an assertion but mm -hmm. anyway yes uh he is uh, uh, let's put it this way behavior that's too generous misbehavior begins to describe what he has been up to maybe yeah but that doesn't that's not that's not clarifying <laughs> was i trying to be clarifying i thought so okay um and now for something completely different that's not what it says here. It doesn't say that. It but does you're not. Saying it that. does. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and now for something completely different. See, the twentieth century is back. I yeah. Um, <clears throat> we could use those guys right about now. Mm -hmm. Does microbiome or diet account for more variation of the way that animal feces smells to humans? For instance, why does dog poop smell so bad yet horse manure is tolerable? And here's a taboo. What brain steps allow one's own poop to smell almost pleasant? <laughs> well, all right. Um, it's too, it's, it's I all, mean, the, the, it's thematically, but I it's think all it's one. two real different questions. No, I, uh, so um, there's so many connections here, but I actually had a um, one of the guys who taught me uh, bat science, uh, Charles Handley, one of the great bat scientists of the 20th century, uh, now gone. But anyway, he was a Smithsonian curator of mammals. Gone to the great cave in the sky. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I hope he I hope he has. Anyway, no, he was a sorry. fascinating guy, fascinating mm -hmm. guy who um, was, as a young man, extremely intrepid, right? Mm. I think, in fact, he had cut his teeth as a biologist on cross-country skis somewhere in the Arctic. I don't know. It was crazy. He had some... Uh, so the cut his teeth part of that was metaphor. Yeah. Okay. Um, but then he went on to be a tropical bat biologist. Um, anyway. <laughs> Having seen just enough of the Arctic. Just enough of much. the Arctic to yes. come up with a better plan. <laughs> anyway, he was an interesting, interesting guy. At the point I met him, he was already quite old. But, um, but anyway, he studied bats. Um, As he, bat biologists are wont to do. Yep. He was very focused on... Uh, Artibius jamaicensis, uh, I believe probably the most common fruit bat in uh, the Neotropics, at least in Central America. Um, and then when he got too old to really chase down the bats, he moved to uh, studying the fig trees that they were so dependent on. Um, anyway, so that he could still, he just, you know, the trees move slower. So They sure do. Um, <clears throat> anyway, he and I, as he was teaching me about bats, we were and taking trees. long uh, walks through the forest in, in Panama and BCI, and we had a conversation about exactly this topic where I confronted him over the issue that there was an evolutionary <laughs> pattern to how things smell to us. And the problem is that most people, including Charles at that point, didn't really have the sense of the way evolution works. So they thought too much that this is basically some um, property of the poop in question uh. rather than a property of the creature, the nose of the beholder, as it were. Um, and the point is so this. This is sort of the origin of you talking about perception-mediated selection. Right. It was very much in mm -hmm. that neighborhood. So anyway, my point to Charles and my point to you in answer to your question is that you have a map inside you, and that map is about hazard, right? And the basic point is you can predict how terrible something will smell based on a historical, an evolutionary historical guess as to how likely that thing is to be dangerous to you, mm -hmm. which then has all kinds of interesting implications. So, um, yeah, uh, Horse poop doesn't smell that bad. Horse is pretty distantly related to you as a mammal. 
and therefore the chances that something in its feces and we also have a pretty uh decent history in in uh with horses so the point is the hazard to you that is posed by the poop of the horse is likely to be low relative to uh the poop of other apes um the uh poop of members of your own species which is likely to be particularly hazardous yeah but i don't, I don't think you can do it um mostly by phylogeny uh, because ungulates um that we have domesticated so I, I could see an argument being made for you know dog poop smells particularly bad because there are domesticates we're eating the same stuff we share a lot of our microbiome they are likely therefore to be able to share pathogens with us yep. same thing potentially for cats but um but uh, fresh carnivore poop of non-domesticated species also smells bad. Now, as soon as it 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 it, it gets it, it, it stops smelling so bad pretty quickly, but um, I would have excuse me, <clears throat> I would have thought it might be about the degree of domestication, uh, and I'm not immediately able to recall exactly what the mammal tree looks like. But uh, horses and carnivorans are both basically pretty distantly related to primates so, so it can't it can't be a phylogenetic closeness no, no, argument you're, you're 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 taking part of my argument but not the whole argument okay my point is it's about hazard yes. and that hazard is going to have components one of which will be phylogenetic another of which is going to be ecological and i'm not totally convinced by what you say about wild carnivore poop um i guess i haven't it's a little hard to say because typically when you happen onto it, it's not all that fresh. And so it may be that my sense that it isn't all that noxious is the result of uh, a temporal issue. I, so I, I, I think that's right, although I'm not 100% sure. And I think basically we are much more likely to have run into uh, the poop of our own species and our domesticates, well, which is which obviously doesn't um, allow us to assess uh, the other part of the question. I just, I don't think that phylogeny is going to play much of a role at all here. I think it's going to be about uh, diet and, and, and gut plus domestication. Uh, no. Well, let's put it this way. Phylogeny will play a role, especially as you get very close to your own species. At least within your own species, you're liable to have special markers, especially because we are a social sure. species. And so therefore, to the extent that one person sickens another person in their group, that's bad for the lineage. And so, and actually this goes back to a discussion in uh, Randy Nessie's um, course on- uh, Evolution of medicine. On evolution of medicine. But, mm -hmm. um, but anyway, the point is the sociality of our species is liable to make um, feces from our own uh, kin, particularly noxious, our kin meaning just members of our species in this case. This does go to the grotesque but uh, apt portion of your question about uh, why the smell of one's own feces is exceptional, and the answer is because it's not likely to make you sick, right? Um, and in fact, you can imagine, I don't know if this is a hypothesis here, but I'm not sure I'd buy this. What do you mean? How could you not? Well, A, I'm not sure I'd buy the premise of the question. Um, and uh, I guess it might be more less likely to make you sick than the shit of someone else, but it still has the capacity to make you sick. Well, not really. Not re I mean, maybe, maybe, but not really. You know, if it's sat somewhere so that bacteria from elsewhere has colonized it, yeah, then yes, uh, it very definitely would. But, but... It's going to be hard to infect yourself with something that you're already infected with. Um, and so um, you could also imagine, imagine that your own shit smelled as horrifying as everyone else's, right? What does that do to the developmental training of a young person having to learn how to control that, that bodily function if they get penalized every time they poop somewhere? Right, so you could imagine. I guess I, again, I just I don't. I don't I, I, I've never heard this before. I don't. I don't agree with the premise. It what does premise? smell just as bad. No, no. Of course, it smells just as bad. But the question is, do do you find it exceptional? And I think what you are responding to is that an adult with a proper developmental environment learns to encode it like everyone else's. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we you know there's this 
famous say, saying about, you know, that person thinks her shit doesn't stink, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the point is that's a reference to the fact that it's encoded, the mapping is different, and that a person might infer that that actually implies something about their special quality rather than implies something about their relationship to the contents of their own gut. Well, aside from the particulars here, there is a question of absolute versus relative, which is what the uh, what your overall answer is about, right? That it's not that um, <clears throat> horse shit does not smell bad. It's that for humans, given what it is that we can get sickened by and therefore what we need to be made aware of, horse shit doesn't smell bad. Right. And so, you know, smell bad is a relative is a, is a claim of perception as opposed to a absolute quality exterior to the nose of the person smelling it of the thing that you are smelling. Right. Now, I will point out that there are certain things that fit this pattern very well, right? Like the horrifying smell of uh, fish or shellfish that have been sitting in the sun, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Particular hazard. The things that grow on these things are very dangerous too. Right. And so right. what you should probably imagine in order to see how all this works yep. is a starving ancestor who encounters various things that might be consumed. And mm -hmm. the smell index is going to be something of a guide of how reluctant you should be about various things. And note that Sushi tastes good, right? Really fresh fish, right, that has not been cooked is actually mm -hmm. safe and uh, as such does not smell horrifying, right? Fish that has been sitting out takes on an odor very rapidly that would absolutely dissuade you from experimenting unless you were in just the uh, deepest kind of starvation. Yep. And I would also point out that cadavers have a special smell, and this is again going to be a matter of Within species, it makes sense to connote a particular warning. And the warning, I believe, is likely to be about dissuading people from consuming members of their own species, right? And the point is, it's not that the individual member of your species is likely to convey some pathogen to you if you were to consume their flesh or their organs. But the danger of opening up that pathway is so great right? That the hazard to your lineage going forward, if it were to get the idea that eating corpses was a good idea, right? That hazard, then evolution would find that path. And having found that path, the cost to your descendants would be immense. And so I believe that selection has built in a penalty to make that experiment very, very unlikely. Awesome. All right. We need to get to a really less gross topic. All right. Let's yeah. do it. Um. Example, I haven't, I haven't read this yet, so bear with me. Example of mirror universe gaslighting. Would it have occurred to Trudeau to accuse the truckers of one, stealing from the homeless, two, soiling streets, and three, waving Nazi flags, if the feeding of the homeless, the cleaning of the streets, and the waving of Canadian flags had not been the three most dominant spectacles? <laughs> wow. That's really interesting. Yep. Um, I mean, it's also, it, it's, it sort of follows the principle of you accuse someone of something they absolutely aren't guilty of, and their denial of it makes some portion of the people hearing the denial think that they're guilty because the act of saying, no, I didn't, uh, triggers some part of us. I, I'm sure there's some psychological principle here, but um, <clears throat> being forced to say, what are you talking about? I didn't do that. Um, unless you can do that really kind of in exactly that way. Like, are you kidding me? No. Um, but, you know, politicians being forced to say, of course I didn't. Why? I, would, I wouldn't do that. It, they always end up looking guilty. And so even if it's a totally made up thing. So in this case, yeah, saying the exact opposite of what is true also can be extraordinarily flustering, right? You're just like, are you, are you kidding me? We're doing the opposite. But the claim like we're doing the opposite also makes makes you look not entirely trustworthy because what are the chances that he's lying that big? Well, he is. Yeah, it's a fascinating puzzle. I mean, we have all encountered truly terrible people who make a habit of accusing you or someone else of exactly the thing that they are guilty of. Right. And it is, as they're doing it sometimes. As they're doing it. And <laughs> it, is, it is bewildering. Yeah. Right? It is, yeah. it is the hardest thing to field. It's like, but... Uh, <laughs> did, is but, it, but <laughs> Right. Oh. Um, and so... Yeah. Mirror universe gaslighting, yes. Mirror universe gaslighting. So uh, 
there are there are various functions where you get two payoffs in one move. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if this isn't one of these things where if if you're a truly terrible person, like let's say Trudeau, for example, <laughs> right? Just <laughs> for tr- instance, for example, truly terrible. Um, um, if you were a truly but terrible Trudeau style did person, did you do this or something on camera at some point? No, I Doesn't think he did him some. A good person? Some, yeah, the <laughs> the whole blackface thing. Just imagine oh, Trudeau yes. in well, yes. yeah, um, mm-hmm. truly terrible Trudeau style person, mm-hmm. right? At the point that they accuse you of exactly the thing that they are doing, mm-hmm. they have gotten two benefits. One, they have delivered a completely vile accusation, right? Because they, being sure. vile and engaged in the thing, have mm-hmm. now delivered that stigma to you because they are terrible mm-hmm. and have no conscience. And they have also then complexified your life because to the extent that your instinct is to say, no, that's what you do. <laughs> the point is, well, now it's he said, she said, or right. whatever, right? Exactly. Well, the truth must be exactly in the middle. No, it must right. not. All I know yes. is that... Trudeau and those other people are accusing each other of the thing, and I don't. Who can have time tell? For this. And I know that I wish I could drive through the streets more easily. So, right. I guess I'll go with Trudeau. Yeah. So it's, it's, I think it's the double benefit, right? Yeah. Of if you well, and he does this with his freaking pandering to uh, to to wokeism as well. You know, like literally blackface dude, yeah, who's somehow getting away with with flying the Black Lives Matter flag, as it as if as if all that didn't happen. Right, right, right. No, the guy with the race problem is <laughs> accusing the truckers with, you know, yes. the mandate problem of having <laughs> a race problem. Yes, the mandate problem of the race problem guys making. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, there we are. That was fun. <laughs> um, myocarditis. The fact that only some people suffer post-vax, is it due to random distribution of spike protein, bad luck, or might some people be more susceptible to gene- due to genetics, or some tolerate it better and never notice the weaker course of illness? Ah, sweet. Yeah. Uh, we, we can do this. Yeah, so- yeah I'm, I'm, it's written sort of telegraphically, so I was just trying to translate it as I was reading it. Many things are true. Yep. One, there is liable to be a roll of the dice thing. Right, like you've got an actual yep. volume of liquid with actual yep. stuff in it, and it is going to circulate in some chaotic way. And to the extent that particular uh, lipid nanoparticle coated pieces of RNA yep. um, bump into the walls in the heart and then get absorbed, whereas others were, you know, three millimeters away from the heart as they went through to tissues downstream yep all of that chaotic flow stuff is going to mean that some people are going to get a huge dose in the heart and some people are going to get a very low dose in the heart and the aspiration thing that uh, john campbell uh surfaced may have everything to say about this because the point is maybe everybody who gets a huge dose in the heart are people where the uh, needle actually hit a circulatory vessel rather than the interstitial space there might be something about the variation between batches, although I don't know if we know anything about what the variation between batches, vaccine batches, uh, actually means in terms of how it manifests in the body. Yeah, if it's even yeah. a thing, and, and right, it's, right. it's tough to, to yep. chase down. Um, there could but be heredita- some heritable differences. My guess is it's very small. Yeah, me too. If it's a component at all, um, I think. Beca- I mean, because because it's your heart, right? It could be because because you simply there's simply no backup. And uh, if it gets there, it's going to be a problem for you. I was thinking, actually, when we were talking in the first hour, um, you know, what else? Well, and obviously, you you and Debbie spent a long time thinking about this for, you know, many years. But, you know, what else might be like the heart and therefore you would predict to have really low repair capacity? And the one thing I came up with, and it's not perfect because we got two of them, is the loop of Henley in the kidney, not kidney tissue writ large, but specifically the mammalian synapomorphy, the, the, yeah. the unique character of mammalian kidneys that allows for um, uh, basically the recovery of more water and the excretion of, of liquid waste through that thing that's called the loop of Henley, which is so thin that you know a, a problem there could could similarly take one of your kidneys offline uh, yeah, potentially right got, away. You've got so many actual loops of Henley Right, I mean these are s- tiny structures, and you have presumably millions of them. 
No, it's a, I'm, I, I hope I'm not wrong here, but you know, there's, there's lots of little things off of it, but like in the main loop, uh, I'm going to stay out of it because I don't know. Okay. Um, I, 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 yeah. I think you got two, basically. Well. Um, but I, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Let's see. You've got other tissues that behave in a weird way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would argue, what, what, what I argued in the paper back in the late 90s, early 2000s, mm-hmm. was um, that certain tissues have reasons not to have high repair capacity and that all of them are low cancer risk and high uh, wearing out potential. Um, that basically that's the pattern that any tissue in which you've got, um, high repair capacity has a substantial risk of tumor growth and a su- substantial capacity to repair damage, but that things like the eye, the eye has a low capacity for repair and tends to wear out. Cartilage has very little capacity for repair, um, and tends to wear out. And you don't get cartilage cancer and you don't get eye cancer but you get like optic nerve cancer like right, there's you nervous tissue cancer you get surrounding there's blood tissue. vessel cancer but the eye itself doesn't tend to get cancer right. is that right yeah right and yeah. the heart doesn't tend to get cancer right the pericardium the membrane around the heart does when people get cancers right uh in that neighborhood that tends to be the pericardium but anyway it's a general general that's pattern. interesting because of course myocarditis and pericarditis are the two are the two kinds of inflammation that are really happening here and and all of the discussion that we had earlier was about myocarditis not pericarditis which is an inflammation of the pericardium which is the yeah. membrane around the heart well that actually it reminds me of something the pericardial cavity. i forgot to say in our right. main podcast which is that effectively the hypothesis uh, that I put forward is a hypothesis of temporary autoimmunity, right? The Explore idea that. So we've got <clears throat> autoimmunity is the immune system mistaking self for hostile and attacking self. Mm-hmm. My argument is the mRNA in heart tissue is likely to trigger the immune system to attack the heart, but the mRNA transcripts that cause the production of the spike protein are presumably transient. And so the point is, if the if the immune system were to hold back and not attack these cells, the cells would go back to being normal. Mm-hmm. And so the point is, it is a temporary autoimmunity that causes the permanent destruction of cells in the heart that then results in the heart being effectively enfeebled, damaged. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, I wish I had said that in the main podcast, but it is what it is. That's what it is indeed. Um, and then, the th- I mean, there's more categories than this, but these, this does seem like a good group of three. Is it luck? Is it genetics? Is it heritable? Um, or do some tolerate it better and never notice the weaker course of illness? Ah, so this, it, this is a biggie. Yeah. Um, if the hypothesis is correct, one of the things that it predicts is that there will be a ton of subclinical myocarditis that will never be described. And what that means, the way we will see it manifest, is shortened lifespans, right? That a large fraction of people ultimately die from heart failure and that those deaths will happen earlier than they would otherwise have happened because their heart has effectively expended what repair capacity it has early in life and been uh, caused to be less capable. Now, this, of course, fits with the observation, which I believe is likely to be robust, that we have an unusual number of people dying during uh, sporting events. And the basic point is that athletes are being pushed to a limit that most people are not regularly pushed to. And that the point is a heart that can function below that threshold will suddenly fail when stressed to a point because it has lost some of its heart capacity to vaccines that trigger this temporary autoimmunity. Yeah, and and there's something new out, which I haven't tracked yet, about catecholamines and, you know, sort of having an environment in which adrenaline and noradrenaline and dopamine, I think, is the third catecholamine, um, being at elevated levels may make uh, heart failure in the already compromised heart more likely, the myocarditis in an already compromised heart more likely, um, but I can't, but I can't track it more than that yet. Yeah, I, I'm, it's on my list of 
places to delve, but I haven't I haven't delved into that result yet. Yeah. Is it possible that we could be genetically selecting unintentionally for partners with a work drive to help provide for a family now that most households require more than one breadwinner? Um yeah, but I mean I don't, I don't think, think we need the word genetically in there. But, yeah, yeah, we don't need genetically. It's unlikely to be genetic right. because the time it would take for such a thing, I mean, A, you've got to evolve some genetic mechanism for recognizing such a thing, and it's a lot easier to evolve yeah. a cultural These mechanism. things are well understood. Uh, I mean, we, we know that they exist culturally, things like the Protestant work ethic. Right. right? And um, you also don't really need the end of that question, right? Because work right. is always productive. So. The nature of the work that we're selecting for in partners may be changing, right? That, you know, desiring to, you know, bring in money to the household as opposed to doing a division of labor uh, in which um, some of the work is definitely not breadwinning per se, yep. um, is l it's less possible yep. in modernity. Yeah. Right. And so to the extent that there's a potential pattern here, a, I believe women will traditionally have always favored this right. characteristic. Sure. And to the extent that there is an impact of needing two breadwinners to float a family, what you will see is that men will prioritize, will begin to prioritize it. Mm -hmm. Since some, this is from Echo. We haven't heard from Echo in a while. Hi, Echo. Since some races are supposed to be more racist, would making the elites more phenotypically diverse create conditions for a more humane globalist policies to emerge downstream? Love you too. Well, boy, I'm trying to I'm trying to understand that question. Certainly, having more diverse elites or phenotypically diverse elites, um, you know, if we're <laughs> the elite class <clears throat> is a is a problem, but actually a more phenotypically diverse elite class would allay some of the problem that they create but would it be substantial enough to make a difference as opposed to just going after the elite class yeah i don't think so because i okay. think the you know this is one of these very frustrating phenomena is the truly terrible elites don't have time for racism they just don't Right? They have time to get the rest of us bent out of shape over it. But the basic point is you'd be a sucky rent-seeking elite if you allowed somebody's color to dissuade you from making a completely despicable bargain with them to make money and accumulate power. So the basic point is... Well, but you might want your country to, to win. Yes, except that's the thing about rent-seeking elites. That's why they suck so badly is they've abandoned that. Our dog is going to eat the FedEx guy. I think that's unlikely. Okay. Um, but in, anyway, the, the point is this. The, the problem, if, you, if your elites are nationalists, right? Mm -hmm. And but mind you, nationalist is the version of this I like least. I like the patriot. I don't like the nationalist. Mm -hmm. And I, I see them as distinct. But if your elites are nationalist, then they are in effect using your nation as a weapon to advance the interests of your lineage, right? But the problem with the rent-seeking elites is that's so cumbersome, mm -hmm. right? Being obligated to a nation is just going to block opportunity after opportunity. So what they do is they abandon things like nation and lineage, and they become extremely greedy and opportunistic. And opportunistic is inconsistent with being prejudiced mm -hmm. right and this is in some sense why we see these like crazy pictures of george w bush holding hands with a sheik mm -hmm. right and it's like you would not expect some swaggering texas dude to be holding hands with a sheik you would expect that to be well outside of the um the overton window for a provincial blah 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 but what you're not getting is that he's he's not provincial, he's not provincial. He's yeah. a he you know I don't mean to pick on him provincial, particularly but, I don't think well, he's the worst of them but as as it turns out no but um but there you know he he came to power in part by 
and I don't know that it was his choice, but, you know, by having his provincial seeming ways played up, you know, he's, right. he's a country guy who likes to clear tumbleweeds or something. It's right? for the cameras. Yeah. It's for right. the cameras. And the point is that's, that's the thing I think people don't anticipate is yeah. that because the elites are not playing for the team that they would like you to believe they're playing for. It's part of why people get suckered by them is they yeah. think that the elites are cheating on their behalf. And the fact is the elites are cheating on their own behalf. Right. And they are using you and they are yeah. using racism in the population, but they don't have time for it because it blocks honest to goodness opportunities to rape and pillage their way through history, yeah. which is their, you know, that's their bread and butter. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> in an effort to prevent what happened to Ukraine from happening further east, I'm wondering if it wouldn't be a bad idea for a bunch of well-trained American soldiers to voluntarily take an extended vacation to Taiwan. Well, um, yeah, the problem is it is not obvious that in our um, stupefyingly stupid state that we are actually in a position to defend Taiwan. Now, this is really the question is, have we left ourselves in a position where we can't even back up the world that we depend on continuing to exist? Yeah. And, you know, I, I think it's so frustrating to watch the blue team cynically obsess about the Russians while engaging in the most studied ignorance of the hazard of the Chinese when in fact the point is okay you've now got a multipolar world yeah. and multiple hazards and you had a beautiful equilibrium which you forgot to notice and forgot to realize your continued capacity to do what you do was dependent on that equilibrium you stopped noticing it the same way you stopped noticing <laughs> that it is miraculous that there is always food in the supermarket. Yeah. And the point mm -hmm. is, if you're like upending the process that puts food in your supermarket because you've become so used to there always being food that you've forgotten that you're dependent on this process you know nothing about, then you could upend it. And then one day yep. it'll be like, well, wait a minute, I'm entitled to have food in my supermarket and it won't be there. Yep. I'm going to cough. I'm going to read you a question. I'm going to go and cough somewhere else. All right. Um, what's the most proactive action one can take regarding the state of the world? Oh, boy. Yep, um, that's a big one. <laughs> what is the most proactive action? Yeah, I think, I, I think I've got this. What you want to do is find people that you can actually depend on. And this is not sufficient to protect you, but it does greatly increase your... Uh, your robustness and maybe more importantly your anti-fragility in the face of an uncertain world. That is to say, let's suppose you have miscalculated and you've misunderstood what the hazard in the world is and something goes wrong, but you have found other people who are good at thinking, who are confronting the same puzzle, well they're liable to fill in what's in your blind spot so that you stop being blind to it. Um, and to the extent that somebody has figured out what the right way to endure a rough patch is, um, you know, you, you can team up. You can you can engage in collective defense of the essentials somehow. That sounded like a good answer when I heard of it. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Good. It's not sufficient. Well, I can't expect sufficiency with a big answer, a big question like no, that. No, you can't. I understand lab leak theory is very strong, but have you seen Professor Edward Steele's work suggesting SARS-CoV-2 came from meteorite shower? Any thoughts? Wow. This is brand new to me. I don't yeah, no, know. I haven't. And no, I can't really imagine that could possibly be the case. I mean, it can't It, it can't be from outside of right, the Earth the because, because, because it's, it's of a, this Earth. It's, it's, it's got the informational molecule of planet Earth. Yeah. yeah. No. Other, other, other planets don't have coronaviruses because we're number one. We are number one. Yeah, biologically. But not for long. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we're pretty much number one biologically for the foreseeable Number one future. in coronaviruses. Certainly. And giraffes. 
sickness. Yes. <laughs> Uh, can I have myocarditis without symptoms? Will it go away? I got tinnitus three days after the booster. Since I have no recourse, should I cheat on my taxes since the government cheated me? Wow. Yeah, no, um, you, you, no, sh you, should you shouldn't. Not cheat on your taxes. You shouldn't, but uh, they really are not holding up their end of the bargain, are they? Nope, they are not. They are not. Uh, can you have myocarditis without symptoms? Yeah, I mean, I think this is the subclinical um, yeah. stuff that you were referring to. And uh, for sure, there will be people who have damage and who are never aware that they had damage and may never become aware that they have damage or may become aware later. Um, oh, it looks like you have some past damage. Your doctor tells you 20 years later and you say, nope, I really don't. So, ah, well, could have been that injection. Yep. Uh, anything else to say here? Will it go away? Um, it does. It seems to pass, but um, but it doesn't. It, it's, it leaves scarring. Well, it will reduce the capacity of your heart. Presumably for life. Now, there. no, I, I want to mm, take that back. Yeah, I don't know that that's true. No, I believe it's true. Okay. But let's put it to you this way. I think what I've learned from Peter McCullough mm -hmm. is that you really have two kinds of myocarditis. You've got an inflammation that goes away but is not the result of cellular destruction. That the myocarditis that is the result of cellular destruction will permanently reduce the capacity of your heart which depending upon what you do, you know, if you're an elite athlete, probably you won't be an elite athlete after that happens. And McCullough's argument is the kind of myocarditis that does not involve cellular destruction is the kind that SARS-CoV-2 causes, mm -hmm. but that the kind of myocarditis uh, that does cause cellular destruction is brought on by presumably, among other things, uh, the mRNA vaccines. Is that, I, is that the right categorization? I think so. Okay. I don't want to represent his position because okay. if I've got it wrong, I've got it wrong. <clears throat> but yes, yep. I believe that is his, his argument. Okay. Could there be an epigenetic mechanism that would tell the offspring how ravenous to be based on whether the parent experienced... Um, the final word is starvation. I'm going to read it again. Could there be an epigenetic mechanism that would tell the offspring how ravenous to be based on whether the parent experienced starvation? Yeah. And um, I'm, I am not immediately familiar with the literature, but there is there is some of exactly this suggesting. Oh, it's, 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 I mean, I think this is like the epigenetic thing that was one of the first to be discovered with in like rats and skipping generations. Yes, and, and, and uh, I've forgotten which population it is. Some very far human population, humans, uh, in which, as I recall it, bodies were buried and effectively frozen, which allowed uh, for some testing 100 years later or something like that. I, I, I've forgotten the story, but yes, this exact pattern has been seen that famine, famine. Uh, triggers an alteration in hunger in later generations. Hunger, and I think um, even like, what is it, like ghrelin um, metabolism, like actually, um, t like not just not just acquisition of calories, but then holding on to those calories, like fat deposition. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely, um, absolutely. Uh, such such that those who have experienced famine um, in their in their recent lineage are more likely um, to you know <laughs> not starve, um, but also not have as easy a time keeping to the weight they may want to be at if they live in a time of plenty. Yep. Do you have thoughts on working in the industrial food industry? I work in a food microbiology lab testing processed foods. I feel like I can, I'm contributing to the poor health of the country. Um, well, uh, certainly we have a problem with food novelty. And this is one of these places where the sales orientation of everything results in us focusing on the glorious aspects of all of these novel foods and ignoring the horrifying risk to our health. Yeah. What? Well, and there's we put in the book. There's one like now well-known example: the antifungals uh, in the shelf-stable foods um, are associated, are now associated, understood to be associated with some number of uh, neurological disorders. I believe I can't remember exactly the specifics. Um, that all said, um, you know, testing processed foods, like, yeah, contributing to this part of the economy is, you know, given that you asked the question, probably not 
uh, if you com had complete freedom to choose what you would be choosing to do with your talents. Um, but what are you testing these processed foods for? You know, g given that this is the economy that we live in now and that many people are depending on these things, are you testing, are you effectively doing food uh, safety testing uh, for food that no is not particularly good for us and is making a lot of people very sick and is you know the fact that more Americans eat this kind of food and therefore more Americans are obese um, directly ties to the fact that more Americans got really really sick from COVID than people in Ethiopia did um, you know that that is true on the other hand you also don't want people getting sick from the actual um, you know, from pathogens in the food either. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it's a, it's a precautionary issue. The point yeah. is you've got the diet that your body is expecting and any deviation from it <clears throat> runs the risk of, um, uh, making things worse. Yeah. Um, do, do I need to find a question that you can disappear yeah. for? Okay. <laughs> Uh, here's two of them. You can just hear them. They're sort of related. Was the extinction of the dinosaurs a one-time event and spring, spring, northern or southern hemisphere? So these are both about about that. Um, so run off. All right. Run off then. <laughs> um, <clears throat> let's see. I've now lost the question. It was about um, dinosaurs. So yes, the dinosaurs... We think um, the, all, the evidence suggests that exactly, exactly right. It was it was a singular event, um, but as I mentioned in the first hour, um, the predominant hypothesis, which is Chicxulub, this meteor that hit off the northern coast of the Yucatan, um, caused um, you know huge disruption. You know, not just not just anything localized, but it was a it was a giant giant meteor and it, and it caused the extinctions worldwide. Um, there is also a possibility of a, I think maybe there's a comet that's now being talked about um, that presumably would have hit somewhere else. Um, and then there's also these, uh, the, the, the Deccan traps in, in India, which is, um, which caused a lot of climate change that wasn't just, just local. Um, so regardless though, they were, uh, one of those events, or two, probably not three, but two, um, two of them acting in concert, were responsible for yes, the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. Um, so I mean, I guess it's not a one-time event because the dinosaurs are still with us. The avian dinosaurs are still being with us. All the ones that matter. Uh, mm, no. All the ones that we can currently point to. Not even that. No. Uh, so spring, northern or southern hemisphere. Yeah, this is this is actually part of what um, we didn't get to in the first hour. Um, <clears throat> Northern spring, uh, the evidence is from some fish at a site, I think it's Tavis site maybe, in, was it South Dakota? Maybe North Dakota, South Dakota, um, wherein you can tell from the way, and I can't remember, I'm not looking at my notes right now, um, you could tell by the way some of the bone is being laid down what part of their seasonal cycle they're in. And so it was the Northern Hemisphere spring um, when all these fish and like everyone else suddenly disappeared. Uh, and the idea is that um, it was organisms, um, mammalian organisms in the south um, that lived far enough south that they would have had to deal with the winter and therefore might have been already underground, hibernating, burrowing or something, would have been protected for the first several months after the impact, if it was Chicxulub, um, and thus had a greater chance of surviving. And of course, that would have been the, the Gondwanan distribution, the, the, the organisms in the, you know, what is modern day Australia, South America, India, Madagascar. Madagascar, Australia, Antarctica, um, whereas the organisms in Laurasia, in um, modern day uh, North America, uh, Europe, and most of Asia, uh, would have been more immediately impacted because it was spring and everyone was out and about. So is the implication yeah. that the mammals, and I guess it would likely be the birds too, that made yeah, it, yeah. Um, were all southern hemisphere and that the northern hemisphere was repopulated by birds and mammals from yeah it can't be exactly that because there's a laurasian distribution like a, you know a lot of the placentals yeah the, were were laurasian in distribution so i actually did not go back and look at the maps that i've got of what we think everything looked like at that point landmass wise yeah uh which maybe i should do because um maybe we just weren't as split up yet um as it seems um and of course you know birds 
birds have an ability to move across landscapes more easily than than the mammals do. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, this this part of the story about what they're for, which which geographic distribution of clay to be have been more likely to survive seems weak. Yeah. Um, but the idea that uh, we can look into the bones well enough to see what the growth patterns are and when they stopped and therefore what season it was for those animals whose bones it was is remarkable to me. Yeah, I must say um, <clears throat> it's uh, probably too much inside baseball, but um, we end up um, with certain views of biases inside other biological disciplines. Yeah, your son's not paying attention. No. Um, oh, for a second it was a <laughs> ventriloquist act. But um, it's so again, funny. Start again. You and I have certain, you know, there are certain exasperating features of the cellular molecular biologists, right? Mm -hmm. There's certain kind of myopia about evolution, for example, amongst the cellular molecular biologists and a propensity to name things in an atrocious way, like to take a gene that is responsible for eyes and to name it eyeless, because if you disrupt the gene, <laughs> you lose your eyes, right? And then there's a kind of myopia and do greaterness among uh, many ecologists, Right, so you sort of. I mean, we definitely we, we don't always master the naming. Although gorilla, gorilla, gorilla is a good one. Oh man, yeah, yeah. you just did really you know hammers the point home. But <laughs> um, but anyway, there are also disciplines that one does not end up rolling their eyes at quite so much. And I must tell you, you know, as you and I developed a healthy respect for the philosophy of science uh, and its importance, even though Dick Alexander always was exasperated at those folks, um, the paleo people, yeah have a lot right there's a mm -hmm. lot it's it's one of the harder disciplines to do well because basically yeah. as bad as the problem is of evolution having had much of the evidence erased by time paleo is like the worst of the worst of that mm -hmm. um, but there are these amazing stories yeah. in which they are able to read things like the seasonality of um, yeah incredible and i mean it just as far as I've seen, you know, really definitely not being a paleontologist at all, um, the inferences that they make, they are not just able to, but inclined to lay them out for you yeah. and be like, this is, hey, we think, we think F, we think F because we saw A, and then from that we applied technique over here and got B, and that must follow, and if B, then C, and hey, we got to do a little fancy thing here, so there's a little bit of a black box here, but then if we're right about what D means, then E, and you know, and, like you could just follow the logic in a way that's that is what all scientists should be doing all the time, what we try to do, but what most people who are calling themselves scientists now make just no attempt at whatsoever. They're like, well, F. We had, we're there. See? Scientist. Therefore, F. What did you do? What's your evidence? What did You're you right. see? It is, the, it is yeah. the, it's the opposite of the sales thing because in some sense, it's like everything interesting that the paleo folks tell us is like, well, wait, how, how could you possibly know that? Right. And, the and maybe they know, like, they know the burden of proof. It's like, I know. You're not going to believe I can right. know this, but check it but out. But check it out. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, you know, conclusion X. <laughs> Really? How, <laughs> yeah. do you, how do you know Spring that? Springtime. And it's like, sure. well, yeah. hear me out, right? It's like every paleo thing is like, a, no, hear me out, right? Yeah. <laughs> and the thing is, it's amazing how often they deliver the goods. Yeah. And it's like, actually, yeah, that is that is pretty compelling argument, <laughs> you know? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, if most people orient through social pressure and marketing, under democracy, don't we need to focus on this? Are we imposing a meritocracy? Wait, wait, try that again. If most people orient through social pressure and marketing under democracy, don't we need to focus on this? Are we imposing a meritocracy? I don't think I quite get it. Well, I, I, I got something in the neighborhood. Okay. You, there's a question. Like in, um, in physics, very often we have a instantaneous measure of something and a integrative measure right and this is one of the things actually our measure of fitness is polluted by an overly close relationship with reproduction 
right? We Mm -hmm. evolutionists have gotten lazy because in general, if you leave more offspring on a short time scale, it makes you more unlikely to go extinct on a long time scale, for example, right? And so we get lazy and we start to think that fitness is reproductive success. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of cases in which fitness isn't reproductive success. In fact, they go in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Um, But we're less good at at thinking about them. And so what I would argue is, all right, here's some place I've changed my mind over my lifetime. Okay. When I was a kid, my grandfather used to argue that um, the key to the world working was education. Mm Mm-hmm. And I knew for sure he was wrong because... You found him naive. Well, the game theory is what it is. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you may know that it's a commons that will suffer a tragedy if you overexploit it doesn't solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And so in some sense, education about a tragedy of the commons does not prevent a tragedy of the commons. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the problem that the person asking this question is pointing to is in some sense... Why are we such suckers, mm-hmm. right? And that's really the issue. It's not, you know, it's not that the market is a problem. It's that suckers in the market are a problem. And if you're a sophisticated consumer in a marketplace of ideas who mm-hmm. knows how to sort out <clears throat> attractive-sounding <throat> bullshit from reality, then the fact that there's attractive-sounding bullshit isn't such a big problem. And so, in any case, I think the point is, you need to have the educational experience that allows you to know when you're being lied to, right? Mm. Allows you to detect it. Mm-hmm. And if that were the case, then the lies wouldn't be so damn devastating. And it is the yeah. fact that we're yeah. dealing with a bunch of people who've gotten really good at lying and never got really good at spotting lies, it's like, oh, that's the worst of both worlds. Yeah, it is. Everybody's a liar <laughs> and nobody spots lies. And yeah. so the point yeah. is you're all like lashing about as the rent seekers are jerking your chain and telling you, oh, here's the you know great danger this week that you need our solution for or you're going to die. And it's... Well, it's consistent too. There, there seems to be, rarely hear it stated, but there seems to be an assumption on many people's part. Like, well, yeah, obviously everyone's lying. Well, well no. Some of us really are not. Well, some and of really us- are trying <clears throat> not to. <clears throat> and the idea that, well, that's just the world we live in. We all lie. No, no, some of us explicitly never signed up for that and have no intention of letting that world become the future if we can stop it. Right. And look what happened to us during COVID is you've got, you know, you've got cynics who were like, everybody's lying, right? And then you've got the dyed in the wool liars. And then you've got the dissidents. And mm-hmm. the point is how you understand the dissidents is entirely dependent on whether or not you had any nuance in this function at all. And if you did have nuance in this function, then you realize, oh, your dissidents are mislabeled as heretics, right? Your dissidents have been labeled as grifters and as uh, um, spreaders of malinformation or whatever (laughs) stupidity they're deploying to make it so you'll look somewhere else. But the basic point is actually, no, there were a bunch of people telling you the truth. And yeah, they're just mislabeled so that you won't listen to them. But I'm reminded of the fact that my parents uh, originally wanted to name me Cassandra. Mm-hmm. And my father uh, decided, uh, imagining that the that the people I would be running into in my life were probably a bit more educated in uh, mythology than they actually were, he decided that that was um, not uh, a fair fate to give to a daughter because he did not <laughs> want to see uh, see his daughter uh, fated to tell the truth and never be believed. <laughs> right, yes. No, it's a, it's a hell of a burden for a girl. But uh... <laughs> um, Anyway. Um, I don't think it worked, though, the changing of the name. Okay. <laughs> no, you got stuck with the job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the job, just with a different name. Um, speaking of following up on something you just said, Mauricio writes, <clears throat> following your MDM analysis, that was the misinformation, disinformation, malinformation analysis from two weeks ago, what are your thoughts on Discord's terms of service now allowing users to snitch and report misinformation resulting in permabans? 
yeah, we are probably going to need to find another home. Yeah, well, uh, what do we think about it, though? Yeah. Um, Could you people who think you know what the truth is enough to (laughs) diagnose when other people aren't saying it, could you get over your fucking selves? Because what? Discord? Discord is a server designed for gamers to talk to each other about fanciful worlds that don't exist. And if you think you are so good at figuring out what the truth is that you can tell people who is speaking intolerable falsehoods, then how did you come by that capacity? Is it magic? Because the rest of us are trying to figure out what's true by talking stuff through. And if you can't do that on Discord, then what's it for? Right? Like, yeah. I mean, this is, this, is, this is the question for all of these platforms. The point is, how do we figure out what's true? We do so by discussing it. And there's actually methods for figuring out you know, I mean, in fact, we talked about it in the first uh, hour of the podcast, right? We figure out what is true based on which truths provide predictive power. Mm-hmm. And is there a division of predictive power at Discord? Right? Do these people have a department of predictive power that is going to allow them to figure out what the truths are that they are the stewards of? Yeah. Because I don't think so. And I think, frankly, you know, whatever 25-year-old intern it is that came up with the idea that they are in such a privileged position regarding truth, that person needs to go back to school. Well, but, uh, you know, the hammer's coming down. Right. I don't I don't think this is this is being generated by the 25 year old interns insofar as we have empowered them to imagine that they get gold stars for everything. And they are living in a world in which uh, truth appears to be a matter of opinion and uh, everyone is lying all the time. But uh, the fact that all of the platforms are circling the wagons even more than they were last summer now. And deciding uh, that science is not science and uh, reality is not reality suggests, I mean, I'm reminded of like, my very first Substack piece, Fact Checkers Aren't Scientists. You know, like the, the, the hubris of the fact checking arm of Facebook, for instance, which is a uh, PolitiFact, I think, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> in which they, you know, they gave, I can't, I have to go back and look at it, but I think they gave, some cl- they gave some claim that you made that was you know two months later demonstrated to be likely to be correct i think it a was the pants uh, on fire rating which yeah. is like their their highest level of like can you believe this asshole right yeah. it's like that level pants on they literally call it pants on fire and i believe liar it was- liar pants on fire and like who again some like 25 year old intern presumably who has like a sociology degree or you know worse and on on what basis? Like, when did we forget what scientists do and how they think and how we're all supposed to be doing science at least a little bit all the time? And, oh, by the way, your opinion today that someone is lying doesn't make it true. Doesn't make it true. And that, kids, is the story of how we got politifucked. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, yeah. it's, it's crazy. And, and the question is, look, Civil, you know, I mean, this is really the, the the Constantine point again. Civilization functions on the basis of certain agreements. Yeah. One of those agreements is that we get to talk about our doubts about things, and if we're wrong about them, then we will find that out through discussion, not through somebody telling us we're not allowed to say those bad things. We have to. We have to. It's the only way we to have do it. to talk about them. Right. And otherwise, so, we we do. We live in a Huxley esque Orwellian landscape that no one should want to live in. Right. And the point is the people inside these organizations, however this happens, whether it's the federal government issuing secret mandates behind the scenes, whether it is them hinting that if you do this thing, uh, we will leave you alone. And if you don't, we will wreck your business. Whatever it is that's happening, the people inside need to find their balls and stand (laughs) up to it. Right. They do because civilization depends on there being some place that we can talk. Yep. And if you haven't figured this out two years into this pandemic then you need to pay attention to a wider set of phenomena because the fact is the people who are issuing these mandates have yet to be right about anything important. Yep. Um, Competing hypothesis. Blood goes to the heart twice before going on to liver, kidneys, gonads. Signs of ovarian damage exist. Nobody's studying it well. 
Oh, I, I like it. And, and I, there is something to the idea of blood goes to the heart twice, but it goes on two different sides. And so we ought to be able to sort. We ought to be able to look yeah. at the damage and actually read this pattern into it. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't buy this precisely because we have a four chambered heart and um, there's a little um, bit of slosh, but for the most part, um, the four chambered heart keeps the pulmonary and the systemic circuitry completely separate. And so the, you know, the cardiac muscle, which is doing the pumping, um, has within it these chambers, these two atria and two ventricles, um, each of which gets, um, you know, half is, is full of blood at any given time, but half of it just came back from the lungs and half of it just came back from the body and never the twain shall meet. That's, you know, that's, that's what four chambered heart means. A three chambered heart, there's a lot of mixing, uh, two, a two chambered heart as well. Um, but yeah, we and, and birds and crocodilians, if memory serves, with our distinctly uh, separate pulmonary and systemic systems uh, don't have the mixing. So I don't understand what that falsifies. Well, what what is it going to a spot twice? If if it's not if if blood isn't going to any spot twice, it's going to like yeah. you've got a vessel right, 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 and right, half right. of it is here and half of it is here. Uh, why would it? Why why would it? Like I, I don't understand because that's two chances. So I, first of all, I'm not compelled that I understand the circulation well enough to know that it would end oh. up there first. But it gets two chances to lodge in the heart somewhere, right? Uh, I guess, I guess. So it, it comes back through some part of the heart and the, in the idea, uh, maybe, maybe. I mean, the thing is you, you ought to be able to, A, I would love to know uh, whether or not there is an asymmetry. Based so I thought it was about a double, like a double dose in a particular place but no the okay yeah somewhere in the heart yeah yep all right well it's an interesting yep. question yep um yeah signs of ovarian damage do exist i think i think uh we have we know this um isn't it more appropriate to call it critical race hypothesis than theory uh, no, Except it's it, neither. It doesn't even rise to that level. Yeah, I mean, but you know, this is the social scientists call a lot of stuff theory that aren't that aren't, and they you know they talk as if they're all big and important um, and making a lot of sense because they use the word theory. And when you ask them what is it, what what even is it? Does it predict anything? What does it even say? Um, often there's no there there. They just they just stick theory on all sorts of things. So I don't think it's not a hypothesis because there's no there's no prediction. It doesn't predict anything. It doesn't, yeah. Well, this has been uh, my point so far. I think I'm the only person who believes this, but um, that the language matters and that we ought to police ourselves very, very carefully according to a single standard across all mm. science and thought where we reserve the word theory for the single hypothesis that has proved out and we don't use it anywhere else because you know if you take even string theory mm -hmm. string theory has not even risen to the level of hypothesis mm. it's string notion right it's something that could be true yeah but we don't have a way to test it uh -huh. um and so the point is by calling itself theory it seems a whole lot more credible than it actually is right. and the same thing is true here with critical race theory it's like critical race notion yeah, it passed no test. Yep. Um, what is the plural form of the word virus? I think it's viruses. Uh, Isn't it? Yeah, although there's a question about what virus actually refers to. Like a, a viral particle would be maybe a virion. Um, yeah, maybe. But anyway, I don't know. It, it's It's a good question. Brett, according to the hypothesis you just laid out, why is myocarditis occurring more frequently in men? Well, um, it might in part be the catecholamine connection. Could be. Let's put it to you this way: there is an asymmetry between male and female that is pretty much written into the universe. Um, interestingly, it re-evolves with multiple instances of male and female um, that causes males to be 
stronger and more fragile. And so men live shorter lives, are stronger at their peak. And this has to do with the game theory surrounding sexual reproduction. And so it is quite likely that one of the advantages that men have in sport has to do with them being built for extreme performance in something like, let's say, warfare, right? Mm -hmm. And that that extreme performance is part of a trade-off and that it borrows from longevity and things like that and that basically, you know, uh, that the heart is more capable and more fragile in men by design. Yep. Which doesn't have anything to do with the hypothesis, but it doesn't need to. Like, you know, a hypothesis yeah. to um, <clears throat> explain, to, to propose an explanation for uh, the myocarditis that, that sometimes follows mRNA vaccination uh, is not expected to, nor should it be expected to, explain all of the variation in myocarditis. Um, right. In, and in, in fact, some... um, you know, again, the subclinical manifestation is going to, we don't actually know that this is more common in males. What we know is that it's diagnosed more frequently, and therefore it may be that females tend to have subclinical cases because yep. of differences in heart design, etc. Thank you for all you do, Heather and Brett. I am at Freedom Camp Wellington, and yesterday I walked over Auckland Harbor Bridge and the mandates. Um, I have been hearing a little bit, and I did not research it well enough to feel like I was prepared to talk about it today, um, but what is happening in New Zealand uh, is extraordinary, and um, you know, it was, it was very uh, easy and compelling and amazing to be very focused on the trucker's convoy in Canada for, for several weeks, uh, and I do, I do hope that what is happening in New Zealand is um, a, a, similar, a similar movement and that it... Uh, effectively acts as part of this giant game of whack-a-mole uh, that we need to be playing. Um, I, I wish I knew a little bit more. I don't know how much you know about the, the protests in New Zealand, but there is a lot of pushback. There's a lot of pushback to what, um, what's her name? Yeah, what's her is name? Is doing, the Prime Minister Ar Arden, Jacinda Arden? Yes. Did I make that up? I don't know if you made that up. Yeah. I, did I make up the fact that she's a uh, World Economic Forum I think she may actually be from outer space. Yeah. Well, we could send her back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe just put her and Trudeau in a room together. And, mm. uh, there's a lot of people to put in that room, though. Mm. Um, how long have we been at it, Zach? Oh, about an hour and 15 minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, let me find two more questions. How All about? Right, two and more then questions, let's, And then let's do it. And uh, I'm glad that our, our panther here quieted down. Um. Well, this isn't true. I'm gonna. This isn't gonna count. But this is seems ill spirited. Brett, do you ever get to point number two or letter B when you are making a point? You often say A or one, but you rarely get to point B or two. <laughs> well, I'm unaware of this. You, I, yeah, yeah, it's not. It's not true. You 100% do, and in fact, I know this to be true because very often he'll say, "Well, point one and point B." Yep. And he often exactly mixes them Which up. Which I so. think is very funny. That's yes, why he I does. Do that. But it does suggest that I do get to point B. Yes, you do. Yes. Yes, you do. Um, we have a few questions here about what um, what our thoughts are about Novavax, and I just I just have not looked into it. Um, do you have anything? Uh, I saw something ominous, but I am going to delve before I leap on that bandwagon or fail to leap on that bandwagon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. One more question. Um, I don't know what this means. Do we expect cooperative immune system interactions within a tonsil hockey team? Okay. I, I got it. I think. Okay. Um, so basically, if you're if you're deeply kissing someone, do you expect cooperative immune system interactions? I think that there is some tale to be told. Mm -hmm. about um, immune systems of those closely affiliated. And we began to talk a little bit about this with respect to a social species and mm. one individual protecting other individuals. So let me just by analogy, yeah. um, there's a 
property of schooling fish that when an individual is destroyed by a predator, it has signals in its cells or in little packets that are released into the water, that the destruction of tissue releases fright signals into the water. I know this from um, amphibian larvae. Salamanders, salamander larvae, and tadpoles. Oh, I don't know this from fish, thing? but uh, no. Well, early hatching, but um, but more generally, uh, that uh, a single destroyed tadpole in in a pond gets everyone to run away. Right. And, well, and actually, um, and uh, accelerate development. So, um, but but yep. the but the early hatching and the um that the workington guess. work with um yeah with the with the cat eyed snake is particular. Yep. But in any case, let's put it this way. We have as a discipline under focused on lineage. And this mm-hmm. is a reason that you hear we, us use the word lineage all the time on this podcast is because very frequently it's the word you're looking for to describe the thing that selection is acting on and we have overly focused on individuals and we have sometimes stupidly not you and me, but the discipline has sometimes stupidly focused on groups, which aren't really an evolutionary thing. But lineage is the responsible way to do this. And because lineages are a real evolutionary thing, and therefore selection favors their preservation, it can make sense for an individual to protect other members of the lineage. Now, tonsil hockey partners are... (laughs) Not exactly. They are simultaneously parts of the same bigger lineage, but they are effectively the starting point of new lineages, right? Mm -hmm. And so that partnership um, does favor the evolution of behaviors that will be, uh, let's say, immunologically protective. So there's Mm -hmm. a question about, you know, is this even what kissing is about? Right? Could it be about some sort of synchrony between immune systems? Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know of any evidence that it is about that, but it's certainly a plausible explanation, which takes the fun out of it. But nonetheless, um, uh, it, it could be a thing. That, that is not a crazy idea. Good. All right. Any last words? Uh, wow. Mm-hmm. Do you know something I don't? <laughs> Um, you don't mean that kind of last words. No. You just mean for the week. Yeah. Just, yeah. just, just for the week, I think. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I would, I would hope, I would hope that our little visit back into the 20th century will have woken us up and we can return to the 21st century and maybe move forward instead of regressing. And anyway, I, uh, maybe next week we'll have good news on that front and um, we can uh, go back to... Um, uh, you know, mocking the woke for just being silly rather than for destroying the equilibrium that we were all depending on. Yeah, no, I don't think we can go back to that. They're not just being silly, although many of them are just silly. Yeah. Um, all right, so consider joining us at my Patreon tomorrow for our private Q&A. The link will be up uh, shortly. And um, in the meantime, be good to the ones you love, eat good food, and get outside. Be well, everyone.